Chris, I've got to make an observation to begin with. This isn't the Holborn. What are you doing up at the assembly rooms? <laughs> so this exhibition, Unlimited, which is about a scheme run in Bath in the 1960s, we've been working on for five years. It was originally going to be at the Holborn um, and then COVID intervened. Um, and then we were um, planning to show it at the University of Bath at the edge there. Um, but then when the National Trust took over the assembly rooms um, last, March, last month, um, in March, we had the opportunity to come and work in partnership with the Trust to present the works here. It feels a little bit counterintuitive, these sort of bright lights, moving part, 60s, late 60s, um, ultra-modern works of art in this grand Georgian setting. But, but they were made and conceived in Widcombe Manor, where Jeremy Fry, who's conceived Unlimited, lived. So it's not completely inappropriate. Well, let's take this step by step. All of this has to do with a man who was well known in his day, Mr. Jeremy Fry. Tell us about him. So Jeremy Fry um, is part of the Fry chocolate dynasty, um, is a, was an engineer, an inventor, an entrepreneur, and also a great socialite and art lover. Um, he started his company Road Talk near Bristol in the late 1950s and moved it to Bath in the 60s. And he made a lot of money producing actuators, which are kind of valves for pipelines, which went around the world. But he was also a part of the 60s art scene in London. You know, he was very well connected with, particularly with um, Princess Margaret and Lord Snowden, famously. Um, and um, in London in the 60s, he met some of these artists who were showing at galleries like Signals and Indica, ultra cool, counterculture sort of spaces um, frequented by people like Paul McCartney and the Rolling Stones. John Lennon and Yoko Ono met at Indica Gallery. And it was there he saw artists like Takis, the, the Greek artist whose work is behind me. And he conceived this idea of mass producing works of art so that more and more people could, could own them for themselves. Were the artists happy with that? Their well, work being mass produced? Well, amazingly, they were. I mean, Takis was the first, and I think you know, there's a film in the show where he talks about his dream of works of art that could be owned by many, many people. And the key to it really was a shift in art, which meant that artists were producing things where their hand was no longer a key part of the making. So they're either manufactured or they're using found parts, you know, and they are engineered. A number of the works use light or movement and motors um, as key to them. So they were things that it could be made without the artist's um, uh, continued involvement. Art for all. Art for all was the dream. Though, I mean, they were still quite pricey. You know, you could buy a work of art for, you know, a tenth or even less than, than a unique work by the same artist. But they were still, you know, 15 pounds, 40 pounds, some of them, which were, you know, like a month's wages or half a month's wages. Um, the whole thing got, came to a screaming halt after two or three years because the uh, Inland Revenue decided that if the works were being produced in unlimited editions, then they were just like any other retail product and they should be subject to purchase tax of VAT, we call it now, um, whereas works of art were exempt. And that extra 55% on the, on the price um, made it unviable. Well, you've collected examples from his unlimited period you're obviously confident that people are going to enjoy looking at it again. Why is that? Well, we've, we've managed to gather an example of every single piece that Unlimited produced and some works which never went into mass production, either because the artist died in the case of Mary Martin or, or the, the project came to an end before the works could be produced. Um, I think these works, you know, they have a lasting appeal there because they play with light, whether the actual lights, like the signals behind me or reflected light and movement. They're very poetic. They have a sort of immediacy, I think, an immediate appeal to people. Um, and, you know, the late 60s is, is, a, is a period that still is very powerful and evocative for us, I think. You're going you're to set off a whole new 1960s <laughs> trend. Uh, the good news, too, I, I know it doesn't benefit you down the road at the Holborn, but free entry. Yes, so, um, so the, the exhibition's here um, in the assembly rooms. It's wonderful to be in central Bath. And um, 
for logistical reasons and as part of the partnership with the National Trust, it is free entry. It's only here for six weeks, so it's shorter than our normal shows at the Holborn. Um, so we hope many, many people will come and see it. Will you do this again? Will you use this space again? We're certainly going to keep an eye out for opportunities. You know, I think it's going to be some time before the Trust fully occupy and restore the assembly rooms and install um, you know, their, their long-term displays here. So in the intervening period, if we can find an excuse to come back, we certainly will.